.NET 6 and C Sharp 10 are absolutely packed with features to make your development experience more intuitive, more streamlined, and just all around more fun. And in this video, I'll just show you some of my favorite features of .NET 6 that I think you'll find useful too. Let's get started. Welcome along or welcome back to our channel. My name is Chris Roberts. Now, one of Microsoft's stated goals when developing .NET 6 has been to make the whole development experience more approachable for new developers. And now with .NET 6, it's really easy to use the SDK to create a project and just get coding. So let's take a look at a brand new web application that's been created by the .NET SDK. As you can see, it is very, very minimal. Now we've had things like top level statements since C Sharp 9 and .NET 5, but you'll also notice that something else is missing as well. Normally you'd have a big long list of using statements at the top of your file, but these appear to be gone. So where are they? Well, C Sharp 10 introduces a feature called global usings, and these do pretty much exactly what they say. They're a using statement that's global. You can specify them once in your project, and then every file will have that namespace imported automatically without having to specify it again. And in .NET 6, the SDK automatically adds a set of these global usings for you. And these are called implicit usings. So let's take a look at what's going on under the hood. If we head over into our object folder and then open up debug, we can see a new file there called globalusings.cs. Now this is an auto-generated file, so you can't edit it directly yourself. But you can, of course, use global usings anywhere in your project. As you can see, the SDK has automatically added all of the Microsoft or ASP.NET Core extensions and the usual system.net and system.threading.tasks namespaces for us. This means anywhere within an application where we need to use a type or a method on one of these namespaces, we don't need to import it. It's already done for us. Now it's worth noting as well that each project type in .NET 6 has its own set of using. So for example, if you were to create a console application in .NET 6, then it wouldn't have all of the ASP.NET Core usings. And likewise, if you created a worker template, for example, it would have a set of usings that were specific to that project type. And as you can see, if we look back at our program CS file, this results in a really minimal starting point so you can get going without much friction at all. Next up, we have some upgrades to the link API. Now link is the method by which we work with collections in C Sharp and .NET. And it's been around for quite a long time, since around 2007. And .NET 6 has got some really nice new features. It will make working with collections easier and more streamlined. The first change I'd like to show you is in the first or default method. Now first or default is a method available on lists and collections that searches through a collection for an item that matches a condition and then returns it if it's in the list or a default value for that type if it isn't. However, until now, it wasn't possible to specify in first or default what you wanted the default value to be. But now you can in .NET 6 with a new overload to the first or default method. Let's take a look. So here we have a user option class. This might be a set of customization options, for example, stored on a user profile in your database. As you can see, each option has a name and a value. And if we look down into our program, we can see we've specified a list of user options. My default region or language, and it just says my favorite beer, which is a lovely Belgian beer called Straffa Hendrik. Now, what if I then wanted to allow the users to customize the default theme in their app? Well, we might do something like this. As you can see, we've specified our preferred theme, and then we look through the options list and look for where the option name is theme. Now, if you run this with .NET Run, we'll see that the preferred theme is blank. Now, what's happened is first, the default has returned a null value because the option isn't available in the list. However, now with .NET 6, we can specify what we want the default value to come back as. So now we just need to pass a second parameter into our first or default call. And this is going to be an item with the name theme, and we'll set the value to dark mode. Now, if we run this again, We'll see that even though the theme item isn't in our user option list, Versal Default has returned dark mode as a theme for us because this is the default we specified. Now, if we go back into our list and add the user option and set it to green and run this again, we'll see that Link has ignored the default value and returned the item in our list. Now let's have a look at a feature that allows you to sort and order collections more effectively. Now, if you have a look at this example, we'll see we have a type of car. It has a name, a horsepower, and a weight. And this could be useful if we're building some kind of top trumps game in C Sharp. Now, in the past, if we wanted to get the most powerful car from this collection, we'd have to order the collection by horsepower and then take the first item off the list. Now in .NET 6, we have two new methods added to the link API. Those are maxby and minby. To show you how they work, 
I've got a collection here of cars. We have the Tesla Model S Plaid with 1,020 horsepower, but it's also 2,200 kilograms in weight. And we have the Renault Twizy, which only has 20 horsepower, but is 450 kilograms in weight. Now, using the new max buy and min buy methods, we can get the most powerful and the lightest car from this collection just in one method call. Let's create a new variable and call it lightest. And using the cars collection, we now have the min buy extension method. This just takes as a parameter which property we want to sort by, in this case, the weight property. We'll create a second item and call this fastest. And this will be the cars collection. And now we'll use the max by method. And we want to look at the power or horsepower property. Let's just uncomment our two console write lines, open up a terminal, and we can run our code. And now we can see that Link has pulled out from our collection the fastest car based on the horsepower and the lightest car based on the weight. So these are two really nice, really useful new methods that will help you order and work with collections more effectively. Now, the last new feature on the Link API that I want to have a look at and show you is the chunk method. Now, this allows you to split up collections into chunks. And this is useful if you have a large collection of items that you want to deal with in batches, or perhaps you want to create pages that your user can sort through. Now the chunk method does it all in one call. So let's take a look at this example. I have here a user class just with a user ID on and I have a user service that returns a list of 50 dummy users with random IDs. My program then gets the users from the service and writes out the length of the collection to the console. Now, if I wanted to split this collection up into batches of 10, I can do it with the new chunk method. Now, let's create a variable to store our user chunks and call it user chunks. And now we're going to call users.chunk. And then we can just pass in the size of our chunks or pages. And we're going to make that size 10. If we look at the return type of chunk, we see that this is an enumerable of user arrays. So this will basically give us a list of lists. So let's just loop through this list and write out the length of each page to the console. For each chunk in user chunks, and we'll write out the length of each chunk. Let's open up our terminal and run a program. And we can see that the number of users coming back from our service is 50, but then the new chunk method has split up the list into chunk sizes of 10. This is really useful when batching up collections into more manageable sizes or providing a paging feature to users to search through large collections. Now, the next new feature of .NET 6 that I really like is one that involves handling dates and times. So in this example here, we can see that we have a date time passed from a string. It has both a date, 5th of April 2063, and a time, 11.15 in the morning. If you run this code, we'll see that our first console write line writes the date and time, and that's fine. However, even on the second line where we've requested only the date, it's still written out the date with a zero time. This can be really inconvenient when you want to work with just the date only. So in .NET 6, there's a new feature or a new set of classes, one called date only and one called time only. And they do exactly what they say. They provide you with just the date or just the time part of a date time. So let's have a look and see how they work. Let's just work with the date on its own. Let's create a date only and we'll call it date. And the date only API is compatible completely with the date time API. So we can call date only dot from date time and then pass in our date time. Likewise, we also have a time only class and we can specify time only time and we can say time only dot from date time date time. Now, if we change our second console write line to just write out the date, then add another log message to write out the time. We can now run this and see that our date time has been written out as expected, but our date only has given us just the date part of our date and our time only has given us just the time part of our date. Now we don't have to provide a date time to work with the date only or time only. We can just work directly with the constructors. So we can create a new date only and we can specify a date, October 21st. And then for the same for our time only, we can create a new time only and we can say we want it at 14.56 in the afternoon. 
We also have a set of parse methods on our date only and time only classes. So we can date only dot parse and we can pass in a date and the same for time only. So these are two useful new APIs in .NET 6 that allow you to work with dates and times on their own. Now the final feature I want to show you in .NET 6 that I really like is a new timer class. Now, if you've been using .NET for a while, you'll know that there are quite a lot of timers in the .NET framework and in .NET SDK. There's actually five different timers and four of them are actually called timers. So the only way that <laughs> the only way that you can tell them apart is by their namespace. So why add another timer to the .NET framework? Well, none of the previous timers are async. They all use events when they're either completed or when each tick on the timer fires. The new timer in .NET 6 supports async out of the box. Now, this isn't necessarily one timer to rule them all because the other timers have features this doesn't and vice versa. But what's great about this is that you can await each tick on the timer. So let's try it out. Let's create a new periodic timer. And into here, we can pass in the period we want between ticks on the timer. And we pass in a time span, and let's say from milliseconds, 500. And to use our timer, we just need to create a loop that waits for each tick. So we'll create a while loop, await timer dot wait for next tick async. And let's just write a message out to the console. Let's open up our terminal and run the code. We can see that our timer is running every second. Now, because this timer supports async and tasks out of the box, it also can take a cancellation token. So if you have a background service where this timer is running, you can pass in a cancellation token. And as soon as that cancellation token is cancelled, then the timer will stop. And passing in a cancellation token is easy. We just send it into the wait for next tick call. So we can just pass in a cancellation token into there. Now, this is a great feature. It's quite new to .NET 6, but I can already think of a few places in my code where I could use it. I feel like this could do with some more features. It would be nice to have some more configuration parameters that we could pass into the constructor, but it's a great start. And I look forward to seeing how this particular API evolves in the future. Now, one final bonus feature of .NET 6. If you're using an M1 Mac, then you'll be glad to know that .NET 6 now runs natively on the M1 chip. No need to run it under Rosetta, which brings, of course, performance and convenience improvements. Well, those were six features and a bonus feature of .NET 6 that I really like and are proving useful to me already and I'm looking forward to using in client projects in the future. Let us know in the comments, what are your favorite features? What are you enjoying using? Have you got any questions or suggestions for future .NET related videos? Let us know down below. If you've enjoyed this video, then please do give us a like. And if you like this kind of content, then do make sure you subscribe and ring that bell icon so you never miss out on a video. And if you want to join us on our developer journey, see the link below. And if you're feeling generous, buy us a coffee. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for your time. Happy coding. We'll see you next time.